Today we're going to be taking a look at amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is the most common form of motor neuron disease. To fully understand ALS or any type of motor neuron disease, it's first important to take a look at the upper and lower motor neuron pathways. So just to explain this diagrammatically, we have a cross section of the brain here, and one part of the brain, and more specifically the frontal lobe of the brain, is termed the motor cortex, which is responsible for directing movements of the body. Now there are many tracts which run from the motor cortex, but we're mainly going to be focusing on two main tracts. The first runs from the motor cortex to the brainstem, and this is termed the corticobulbar tract. The second tract runs from the cortex to the spinal cord, and this is termed the corticospinal tract. And the main point I want to emphasize here is that both of these tracts are what are termed upper motor neurons because they originate from the motor cortex itself. In terms of the lower motor neurons, we have some neurons which run from the brainstem to the muscles within the face, and these are termed the cranial nerves, and they're involved in chewing, swallowing, and other facial movements. And then the second group of lower motor neurons are termed the peripheral motor neurons, and these innervate skeletal muscle to allow movement of the trunk and limbs. Before we take a look at ALS in particular, we have to look at what happens individually in cases of upper motor neuron lesions and lower motor neuron lesions. So just to define an upper motor neuron lesion, this would affect motor neurons above the nuclei of the cranial nerves or above the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord. And to simplify this, this would mean that there's an issue with either the corticobulbar tract or the corticospinal tract. Examples of things which can go wrong with each of these tracts include strokes, tumors, and infections. And these issues basically impair the transmission of signals from these upper motor neurons. And this can lead to an array of different symptoms, including weakness, increased tone or spasticity, increased reflexes or hyperreflexia, and upgoing planters. And just to explain the changes in reflexes, we have a simplified diagram of the knee-jerk reflex here, where a tendon hammer is applied to the patella, and signals are transmitted from the knee to the spinal cord via afferent sensory neurons. In return, the spinal cord transmits an impulse from the spinal cord to the knee via efferent motor neurons, which results in the reflex response. Now importantly, in this arc, we actually do have some upper motor neuron input as well, and this input basically helps to inhibit the reflex. Therefore, when there's an upper motor neuron lesion, this inhibitory effect is also prevented, which results in an exacerbation of reflexes, explaining why there's hyperreflexia. Turning towards lower motor neuron lesions, these can affect the cranial nerves or the peripheral spinal nerves, which both lie below the corticobulbar and corticospinal tracts respectively. Examples of lower motor neuron lesions can include nerve compression or trauma, autoimmune conditions, or infections. And these lesions lead to a different array of symptoms compared with upper motor neurons. Initially, they can be thought to cause the reverse symptoms of upper motor neuron lesions. So for example, we'd get decreased tone or flaccidity, hyporeflexia, and downgoing planters. We also get some additional symptoms, which include fasciculations, which are basically small twitching of muscles, muscle wasting or atrophy, so shrinking of the muscles because they're not being used as frequently, as well as weakness, which is a result of the atrophy process. Now that we understand both upper and lower motor neuron lesions, we can take a look at ALS, which can be defined as a neurodegenerative condition that affects both the upper motor neurons, so the corticobulbar and corticospinal tracts, as well as the lower motor neurons, so the cranial nerves and the peripheral motor neurons. And this results in a mixed range of upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron symptoms. We can take a closer look at what's happening at a more cellular level, where there's a gradual deterioration of the motor neurons due to an unknown source. And this basically leads to damage of motor neurons over time. If some motor neurons are particularly affected more than others, this can result in the destruction of the entire neuron, which leads to poor nerve signaling and therefore muscle dysfunction. Importantly, around 90% of cases of ALS have no clear cause, and the remaining 10% are hereditary ALS, which is mostly transmitted via an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern.
This would mean that the child of someone with ALS has a 50% chance of inheriting the gene from a parent. As I've mentioned, ALS would present with both upper and lower motor neuron signs, and this would result in mixed presentations depending on the patient. So for example, there might be hyperreflexia in some areas where upper motor neurons are affected more, and hyporeflexia in others where the lower motor neurons are predominantly affected. Importantly, ALS is a progressive condition, and the most common cause of death is respiratory failure, as the respiratory muscles lose their function over time. For the purposes of examinations, the most common presentation prompts may include wasting of the hand muscles and tongue fasciculations. So if you see any of these, you can think of ALS or other motor neuron disease as possible differential diagnoses. In terms of the diagnosis of ALS, this is mostly a clinical diagnosis based on symptom review by a trained clinical neurologist. However, it is important to rule out other causes, which can include possible infections, vitamin or electrolyte deficiencies, and other neurological conditions. Depending on the level of clinical suspicion, patients may undergo muscle biopsies, lumbar punctures, and imaging of the brain or spinal cord to eliminate other causes. In some instances, patients may also undergo nerve conduction studies or electromyography, and these are basically different ways of determining whether the signaling within motor neurons are impaired. In particular, electromyography may show fibrillations or fasciculations, which are commonly seen in ALS. For the treatment options of ALS, there's currently no cure for the condition, and the usual prognosis is around three to five years after the initial diagnosis is made. However, there are some management options which can help improve the lives of patients with ALS. For example, one drug called Rilazole is the only medication shown to slow the progression of ALS so far. And just to give an indication of how this works, glutamate is one of the main neurotransmitters involved in the aging of motor neurons. And in patients with ALS, they often have higher levels of glutamate than normal. This results in an increased rate of neuronal death or injury. Rilazole aims to work by reducing the levels of glutamate and thereby improving the neurotransmitter balance, resulting in a decreased rate of neuronal injury. Aside from the medical management, patients may also be directed towards symptomatic management, and this includes a combination of medication, physiotherapy, and nutritional treatment options. Some of the main interventions used include baclofen, which can help to reduce muscle spasms, gabapentin, which is used to assist with neuropathic pain, and in later stages of the condition, non-invasive ventilation may be considered to help with respiratory effort. And here we have a quick summary slide outlining the main points from this video. I hope you found this video helpful and I'll see you in the next one.